The Waco History Podcast is sponsored by Brotherwell Brewery on Historic Bridge Street in Waco. Cross the Brazos and Waco Ride hard and I'll make it by dawn Cross the Brazos and Waco I'm safe when I reach San Antonio This is the Waco History Podcast. Welcome uh, to the next episode, and we have Ashley Bean Thornton with us today. And uh, you could know Ashley from a lot of different angles. Uh, She's done dozens of walks around town. How how many walks are you up to, Ashley? Oh, my gosh, I have no idea. So if if someone's listening and they're going, wait, what are these walks? How would they find out about, because you always have new ones upcoming. Right, right. Well, it's yeah. called the organization, and I'm doing air quotes around that. It's called Waco Walks, and mm-hmm. it's a spinoff from Act Locally Waco. So the easiest, well, the most uh, dependable way to find out about it is to go to the Act Locally Waco website, actlocallywaco.org, and there's a Waco Walks tab. Mm-hmm. But there's also Waco Walks on Facebook. Okay. So those are the two yeah, two best ways. And I know you do the tornado walk every year. Right. And, but then but there's always a variety of different walks right. that you've done. Some more historical, one more, some more talking about current plans for right. Waco and things mm-hmm. like that. Um, and so, yes. And so the other, the other thing that you might know uh, Ashley from is Act Locally, uh, which is, was her brainchild, right? Right. So talk about the genesis of Act Locally and kind of when that started. Uh, well, it came out of... Uh, I had kind of a life-changing experience having to do with Hurricane Katrina, and that spurred me to get more involved in the community. Uh, But I was working at the time, so I needed to find something that I could do in odd hours. Mm -hmm. And that just happened to be the same time that web pages were getting to where normal people could kind of do them, and and a lot of things were coming together, and it seemed like a good time to start a community calendar of Mm -hmm. all the different things that were going on around town. Waco was really uh, on the cusp of having a lot more things to do, Mm -hmm. and there were a lot of nonprofit things going on, and that seemed like a a little niche that I could step into and help with and uh, use my time productively, so that's how it got started. Well, do you, do you mind sharing the Hurricane Katrina? Uh, the oral historian an- <laughs> antenna in me went up. I want to I want to hear the Hurricane Katrina story. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, my family's from the Gulf Coast. I we moved around a lot when I was little in the Mississippi, Louisiana, and then finally Texas, mostly on the Gulf Coast. Uh, and so when Hurricane Katrina happened, it pulled at my heartstrings because we had lived in Slidell for mm. several years, which was right down there. Mm-hmm. And our church students, our youth group, usually goes or used to go to this camp called, I can't remember the name of it now. I can't believe, oh, Passport was the name of the camp. Mm-hmm. And so in that, that particular summer youth camp usually always had a, some kind of work component, missions component. Mm -hmm. And so not the year of the hurricane, but the next year, the work component of that camp was to go to New Orleans and help with Hurricane Katrina cleanup. I see. And my husband's a school teacher, so a lot of times he gets recruited to do summer things because he has time in the summer. And he recruited me to go with him (laughs) (laughs) on this particular trip. And uh, so we went down there, and the group that kind of organized our work in the Ninth Ward, which was kind of the lower income part of town mm-hmm. that had just been absolutely mowed flat by the hurricane, uh, was this group called Acorn that did a lot of good work in the city, later fell into some disrepute uh, in some other cities, I think. But in New Orleans, they were doing some fantastic work. And they did a really good job not only of organizing our work, but also about talking to us about the situation in New Orleans, and they just pretty bluntly pointed out, uh, this was a year later, right? And so they pointed out in the well-off parts of town, things are looking fine, there was damage, but it's mostly been repaired, people are going about their lives. In kind of the middle-income parts of town, likewise, things were a lot better, people were settling back in uh, and getting their houses repaired and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But in the Ninth Ward where we were, it was as if the hurricane had happened the week before. Yeah. I mean, there were still cars up in trees. They warned us to wear our full hazmat into the houses because the refrigerators hadn't been opened in a year and no telling what was in there. And 
I mean, it just this, the reality of it was just stark. Yeah. And so since it was youth group, uh, we were having these little confabs in the evenings where we would talk to the kids about, you know, what would you do today and how did that strike you? And one of the students who had gone with us mentioned, well, you know, they keep talking about poverty and all these things in New Orleans, and um, but it's just as bad in Waco. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, we had probably lived in Waco at that time maybe 10 years or so, and I just really hadn't thought anything about that. You know, mm-hmm. I was working mainly at Baylor by that time and mm-hmm. just going back and forth from home to work and not really paying much attention to my surroundings. Uh, well, when I got back home, you know, that really kind of struck a chord with me, and I started doing a little bit of research, and sure enough, that was a pretty accurate yeah. description that the poverty level in Waco was about like it was in New Orleans, and uh, I just started learning more and more about it. I had never really been involved in community stuff growing up. Uh, we didn't. I guess it's a little bit ironic to say we did a lot of stuff at the church, but not much in the community, yeah. <laughs> and that was just very different back then. Mm-hmm. I think churches are more involved in the community now, or some are, and uh so I just didn't know much about that, but I learned a lot. I started going to a lot of meetings and uh, meeting a lot of people. And uh, in the midst of doing all that was when I figured out, well, you know, I, I can vividly remember going to one meeting. It was a meeting of different groups that had food pantries. And at the end of the meeting, we were in around the circle. It was about, you know, eight or ten people. And everybody told, you know, what events they had coming up. And I remember it was like, well, February 2nd, we have this big event. We're doing this and this and this. And then the next person said, oh, well, we've got our big deal on February 2nd, too. <laughs> you know, yeah. And going around the circle in it. And it just struck me that it'd be nice to have a calendar with all that stuff on it. Mm-hmm. And so that's how I, luckily, Waco got started. Well, it's, I would encourage uh, folks listening to sign up for the Friday, the Act Locally and the Friday uh-huh. Update. I right. rely on mm-hmm. every week to know what's going on that weekend. And, I know you've been involved in reading clubs in the schools. Right. You've uh, book clubs. Uh, I know y'all are always reading a book, it right, seems right. like. And so just uh, Ashley's very involved uh, out in the community. So I appreciate you talking a little bit about that. That's not what you came <laughs> to talk <laughs> well, that's about. That's easy for me to talk about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I asked Ashley to come in and visit. Ashley and I uh, have a common bond in that we run into each other at Whataburger for yes. brec- breakfast every now and then. And uh, so if my wife's listening, that's why I skipped breakfast at home. I went to Whataburger. <laughs> uh, so well, she's not listening. Um, but uh, when I saw Ashley last time, I've been wanting to have her on the podcast. And Ashley did a, a presentation last year for a Historic Waco Foundation on the kind of history of hotels in Waco. And so she did a lot of research on particularly hotels in the downtown area, Waco proper. Right. And hotels have become a such a big part of Waco's present right now. Right. I mean, it, you know, occupancy rates and things like that that are talked about in a way that I don't remember us talking about them 10 years ago. And so mm-hmm. so I'm interested uh, just if you can kind of give us some of the history of, you know, Waco's always been this crossroads, but um, uh, how we've kind of welcomed the stranger uh, <laughs> in, in these hotel spaces over time. Talk a little bit about some of the things you found in your research. Uh, well, like you're saying, I focused mainly on downtown mm-hmm. and specifically really on five hotels. And uh, one of the most interesting things to me was uh, Jill Barrow, who was running the Historic Waco Foundation at the time, was the one who asked me to do this. Well, I didn't know anything about hotels. I don't have any particular experience with that. And I had never really thought about the role that a hotel plays in a city before. Uh, and so that was just kind of interesting to think about. I mean, I always just think of it as a place for me to stay when I'm going to another city. But really, hotels, maybe more in the past than now, but but I don't think so. I think probably still today are not. I mean, just think of all the different associations you have with a hotel. You know, of course, traveling, but also, you know, think of all the mystery movies you've seen where it's either a seedy hotel or a ritzy hotel and all these clandestine meetings are occurring and Mm -hmm. and then also hotels uh are a lot of times a big political place where a lot of political wheeler dealering happens i mean the watergate hotel Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know (laughs) and uh 
uh, I mean, and they're a way for a city to welcome the stranger, like you say, but also to meet with itself. There are a lot of times mm-hmm. they're a community place. A lot of times that's where people go. A lot of times that's where nice restaurants are or where you can go for music and dancing and that kind of thing. A lot of times that's a hotel. Uh, so I hadn't really thought about all of those different things. And then also I think kind of my theme for the presentation was kind of bearing witness mm. to the town. Yeah. You know, these these five hotels kind of ranged over uh, more than 100 years of Waco history. And so one of the interesting things to me was just to think about how they bore witness uh, to that history mm-hmm. and how a lot of it happened either in the hotel or around the hotels. Or uh, So it turned out to be really interesting, a lot more interesting than I realized it was going to be. I mean, I guess my initial interest was just how pretty the buildings were. Yeah. I mean, there were... Yeah. Some really amazing hotel buildings. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, you're giving a good teaser there. So, <laughs> so um, I, I'm going to ask at some point how you pick the five, but that's mm-hmm. probably a question we ought to save a little bit. So, what would be maybe the first hotel that you started with? to Kind of start looking at kind of this story of hotels in Waco. Well, the first one that I looked into was the McClelland Hotel which was I had always had this little curiosity about it because of the walks. Uh Uh, Because when we do, I mean, we've done several kind of downtown history walks, and we always talk about, you know, where Dr. Pepper was invented. And so we're standing right there on where the Tornado Memorial is now, Uh you know, and there's a little plaque in the ground there that says this is where Dr. Pepper was invented. But it But the old corner drugstore where Dr. Pepper was invented, I knew from a picture I was looking at, was in the first floor of the McClellan House Hotel. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but in the different things I had read, I had read that the Roosevelt building now, but Mm -hmm. was a hotel, was built where the McClelland House Hotel was, but that couldn't be <laughs> because yeah, because that's Caddy Corner because it's Caddy Corner, yeah. and so one of the first things I did was learn about the McClelland Hotel, and turns out was connected to the Roosevelt Hotel, which is kind of a very interesting little Waco history story. Uh, but it was, in fact, at the place where the Tornado Memorial is. That's where okay. the McClelland House Hotel was, which was one of the was the first big hotel in Waco, mm-hmm. uh, and it was probably the biggest hotel in Texas for a while. So, b- by beds, like how many beds would the McClelland House have? Mm, I think I think I I think I want to say two hundred rooms. Oh my goodness! I'm yeah. Not, yeah, so a big I hotel that written down somewhere. Yeah. But, but, uh, yeah, no, it was a huge mm-hmm. hotel. And one of my favorite things, I brought some of my notes here so I can uh, read to you, but one of my favorite things in doing this research was reading all the different little newspaper articles <laughs> and things like that about the different people in hotels and things because the the journalism back then <laughs> uh, tended toward a more flowery style than we're used to. And so this is, uh, no, it was 103 rooms. Okay, four stories high, 103 rooms was the McClellan and House And what Hotel. year? 1872. Okay. So you think about the suspension bridge in 1870. Mm-hmm. This was 1872 during uh, Reconstruction mm-hmm. and all those times the Chisholm Trail. Still is cooking. Still yeah. cooking, like mm-hmm. you say. So it was busy times. But, uh, but I love this little quote about it. This is from John Sleeper, who was one of the uh, people who was very good about writing things down back then. I guess he was one of our first historians. But anyway, he he describes it this way. He says, Fulton, when he launched his boat upon the waters of the Hudson, was thought a fanatic, reckless in expenditures, and needing a guardian to prevent (laughs) self-ruin. Mr. McClelland, when he removed a comfortable frame residence, dug up by the roots large shade trees, and laid the foundation for that mammoth hotel, the McClelland House, was thought by the populace to have overdone the thing very considerably. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was a great description. Because uh-huh. <laughs> I can just see people, you know, here he's digging up these trees and knocking down this house, and the people in the street are just going... 
This guy is a yeah. lunatic. <laughs> He's lost it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, right, right they there had, in the heart yeah. of Waco. Yeah, right there in the heart of Waco. Right, you could see everything from there. You could see the town square from there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that would have wouldn't have. I mean, the town square would have been at the end of that block. Right, at right. At the end of that yeah. block. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you uh, you said you were interested in kind of the buildings, but you began to discover the stories, right, right, uh, and the personalities. Were there right. some attached to? Uh, the McClellan House. Oh, and, and yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about those now. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, just to stick with Peter McClellan yeah. for a little bit, he uh, so he was involved in a lot of things, not just hotels. I think he started out as a grocer and other buildings. I mean, a lot, a lot of the movers and shakers back then had their fingers in a yeah. lot of different pies, and I guess still do now. But um, but he really did. And when he died, he was probably the richest man in McLennan County. Mm. I mean, he was so rich that they reported on him dying in the New York Times. Oh, wow. I, mean, <laughs> I mean, it was big news all across the country. And one of the things that was big news about it was that uh, he left his fortune to his second wife. Uh, I don't know what happened to his first wife. I guess she died. I don't know that for sure. But his second wife and his son by the first wife. And his son was Peter McClellan Jr., well, you know, here's this fabulously wealthy man, and in his will, he said that they would both, the wife and the son, would both get an allowance, basically. So the son was to get $150 a month until for 25 years. Uh, so he was already 32 when his dad died, so mm-hmm. he was supposed to get $150 a month for 25 years, which is not chicken feed, but was not what the son was expecting, I'm mm-hmm. sure. And there was also a little codicil that was added to the will in like the last months of Peter Sr.'s life saying that he would get the rest of the fortune either at the end of the 25 years or whenever the trustees of the will decided that he had attained the discretion to manage the estate (laughs) responsibly. Well, okay, so yeah. Peter, young Peter, Peter Jr., flipped out, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, just immediately uh, started legal proceedings to break the will and to get his uh, fortune ahead of that time and, you know, uh, said, you know, that his father in his dotage had been convinced by these disreputable characters to you know, put this in his will, and he was a very responsible person, and, you know, most of what I read agreed with that, that Mm. he was a very responsible person, and why didn't he um, end up getting the fortune quick, more quickly? Uh (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But, (laughs) so, uh, there's kind of two branches to this story. So, one branch is that maybe his dad knew him a little better than he thought he did, because, a few years later, so is Mr. Peter McClellan Sr. dies, I think, in, I don't know, 1900, something like that. And a few years after that, I could look and find the exact dates, uh, but a few years after that, Junior's wife sues him for divorce. And about a year after that, because it turns out the courts move really slowly, <laughs> <laughs> they have the actual jury trial i didn't know divorces resulted in a jury trial but one of the people who testified at the trial was josie bennett who was described in the paper as a woman of the town i see but was one of the more famous madams Mm -hmm. from the The reservation reservation, Mm. who said that peter jr had come to her with advice about how for advice about how to poison his wife or how to set up a gun so that it would discharge and killer and so mrs mcclellan jr dora thought that would be good grounds for divorce Mm -hmm. and so she sued him it's kind of petty over that i know right (laughs) uh but it didn't it was a hung jury it was six to six Mm. so uh so she didn't end up getting her alimony that she was requesting Mm -hmm. and i guess people didn't necessarily think josie bennett was that good of a 
reference. Mm -hmm. Uh, But anyway, so Peter Jr. continues to contest this will, continues, continues, continues until, I mean, for 40 years he fights the will. And finally, in I think 1924, 1925, something like that, he finally breaks the will and inherits the fortune, you know, that's been kept by trustees all this time. And two weeks later, he dies. So he doesn't ever. So what's the moral of the story? (laughs) Well, what's the lesson there? That, that's to be pondered by wiser <laughs> heads than mine. But anyway, he uh, ends up, it ends up the, the, how this connects to the Roosevelt Hotel, uh-huh. which is catty corner to where the, and this, that building is still here today, yeah. to where the McClellan building was, is that land was part of the estate. And it had already, by previous arrangement, it had been arranged that if Junior won his court case, that that land was going to go to the lawyer one of the lawyers as part of the payment. So the land goes to the lawyer. The lawyer dies two weeks later. So wow. <laughs> they get either. So the lawyer's widow and the other lawyer who was in on it uh-huh. uh, end up selling the money to this organization called the Waco Development Company. Selling the land. Yeah, to selling the, the land. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, selling the land to the Waco Development Company. They go in cahoots with uh, Conrad Hilton and build what's now called the Roosevelt Building. Oh, wow. So. Okay. Yeah. So, so <laughs> and then h- how long does the McClellan House stand? When is it? Is it there until the tornado? No, no. it stood until 1916, and then it burned. Okay. It was, uh, it went through a couple of name changes. Mm-hmm. It was, I think, when it finally burned, it was called the Interurban Hotel. Okay. Uh, yeah, which it, had been completed, and I guess would run right by it there. Right, yeah, right, yeah. 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 And so, uh, but it burned down in 1960, okay. which was a common fate for mm-hmm. one of these old hotels. Mm-hmm. So is the, does that transition us to the Roosevelt as your second hotel? Well, the Roosevelt um, was actually the last hotel that I talked about because it's the newest yeah. of all the hotels. Yeah. But, the, but they were probably the first two that I learned about, mm-hmm. you know. And, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, it's an interesting, beautiful hotel. It was built in, so the Swaco Development Company hired Con- Conrad Hilton at the time had bought and refurbished one hotel in Dallas. He's from New Mexico, I think. But he had bought and refurbished a hotel in Dallas or Frisco or some place up in the Dallas glob. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then he had built one hotel from the ground up at that time. So this ho- what was the Hilton Waco Hilton was the third Hilton in the third Hilton Hotel mm-hmm. in the Hilton Empire, I guess. Mm-hmm. And so uh, he, you know, went into partnership with this Waco Development Company. They bought, this is right during the time, let's see, the, uh, so this was in the 1920, 1924. Um, so the Cotton Palace was still mm-hmm. going strong, um, and that's where a lot of people, and, and when, it, when the hotel opened, the hotel opened in 19, I want to say 1928. The hotel opens, and there's like this huge, you know, uh, celebration. And the newspaper runs like a 20-page special section on this new grand hotel that's opening up. And it has all these stories on every possible thing you can imagine, the electrical system and the coffee shop and all of these things and every you know, the history of hotels all the way from Pompeii to the present <laughs> and, you know, all this stuff about how excited everybody is about this big hotel. And and then all of this, you know, this is the centerpiece of all the growth in Waco and Waco and, I, you know, all these articles about all these new things that are coming to Waco and new industry and new schools and new homes and new businesses and all this stuff. And everybody's just ecstatic about it. So ecstatic. When you look at the pictures in the section in the paper, the hotel itself is only about half the size of that it is now. Mm-hmm. And then even before they finished building it, he added on another 200 rooms. And you can see, if you look at the Roosevelt Building now on the side, you can see kind of the seam where the two... That, that annex that was built right, out there. Right, right. Huh, it's a little slightly different color brick, mm-hmm. and you can kind of tell the difference. But anyway, it was all this hoopla and da-da-da, and Waco is, you know, on the map and la-la-la-la. 
And then, of course, now looking back on it, we know that two years later, yeah. the depression and all of that just went kaflooey, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so Conrad Hilton ended up getting behind on all his payments. The Waco Development Company took back over the building. And uh, they reopened it as the Roosevelt. And that's another thing that's interesting, looking at the newspaper articles about it. Because now, you know, everybody has such mixed feelings about whoever the president is, Mm -hmm. right? But then it was like, Franklin Roosevelt, the greatest man on earth. (laughs) You know, (laughs) that's who they were naming the hotel after. And, of course, it became, you know, the fancy-schmancy hotel in Waco. And they they did pretty well with it, even... uh, you know, despite the depression and despite cotton kind of tanking and all that kind of stuff, they, uh, it's, I mean, it's such a beautiful building, still a beautiful building now. It is. Yeah, and they did a great um, job with the remodel on that building. Yeah. Uh, Rick Tullis, I uh, had him in to talk about air conditioning in Waco. Ah. And I know the common spaces uh-huh. in the Roosevelt yes. were air conditioned, yes, yeah, which, was which was part of the wonders, right, I guess. Right, right. Yes. Of and the Hilton, sound, of yes. the Hilton, not the Roosevelt. But yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. yeah soundproof coffee shop i I thought that was kind of intriguing like (laughs) (laughs) why (laughs) why (laughs) why i mean is that is that uh i guess the train's not terribly far away i mean is that yeah Yeah, maybe i don't know i don't know okay so those were your bookends so mcclellan and the roosevelt what were some Mm -hmm. other hotels you what you researched uh you know probably my favorite one the one that i thought was most interesting i mean they were all interesting you Mm -hmm. know but they're they were mainly interesting for the things that kind of happened around them Mm -hmm. like the pacific hotel right in front of the pacific hotel was where the brand Mm -hmm. shooting was uh and the um the Metropole, well, the Pacific Hotel became the Metropole Hotel. And then the Natatorium, you know, that got mm-hmm. to be a big deal because of uh, the artesian waters and the spa and all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, those were very interesting. But probably my favorite, my other favorite story was the story of the what became the Raleigh Hotel, which is the other one that the building is still here. Mm-hmm. Uh, of the five I talked about, let's see, the, the McClelland, the Pacific the Natatorium, the Riggins, Riggins Raleigh, and the Roosevelt. The the building of the Riggins Raleigh and the building of the Roosevelt are the only two that are still around, even though those buildings are not hotels anymore. Mm -hmm. But the the Riggins Hotel, so uh, there was this man who lived in Waco. His name was J.W. Riggins, and he came to Waco I think he was a Presbyterian minister at first and came to Waco, but he couldn't make any money doing that. But his brother was already here, and they went into business at a hardware store, but they went broke, and uh, he only had $10 to his name. <laughs> and then they started some kind of, what I don't know, I could never tell what kind of business it was, but it was a business that involved trading things. And so they would, uh, and so he made a bunch of money doing that, and he was very politically involved, and eventually he ran for mayor. So he ran for mayor. I'm leafing through my notes here so I can get all the dates and things right. So he ran for mayor in 1900 and uh, beat Champ McCullough, who mm-hmm. was, like, super popular at the time. Mm-hmm. And then he ran again in 1902 and beat Felix Robertson, I think was his name, who was uh, – a well-known Confederate war hero, and um, but the 1902, right after the 1902 election, he was impeached by the city council, which I didn't even know you could do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but and evidently he didn't know you could do that either <laughs> because he sued the city council on the grounds that you you can't impeach me. There's no rules about how you can impeach me. And so that was tied up in the court for a while, but finally the court agreed with the city council, and uh, they commenced an impeachment trial, and uh, he did get impeached, and so that meant they had to elect a new mayor. So there was seven days of electioneering for who's going to be the new mayor, and one of the things he was impeached for was... Uh, because he didn't pay the the city attorney, (laughs) 
Well, he was impeached for all kinds of, you know, incompetence and this, that, and the other. And one of the evidences that he was incompetent was that he hadn't paid the city attorney. <laughs> uh, he always claimed that he was being impeached because he was anti-prohibition. Mm. And a lot of the movers and shakers in town were very passionate about prohibition. I see. And, uh, but anyway, uh, the city attorney was who ran against him. And so there's all this super, you know, hyper electioneering with people riding around town on horses from election spot to it's from voting place to voting place, campaigning and this, that and the other. But eventually he loses. So J.W. Riggins loses. The city attorney becomes the mayor. Riggins packs up and moves away to California. So he moves to California. This is 1902. You know, he probably moves two or three years later uh, and makes his fortune in California. So he comes back about 1910, mm. and he's kind of, you know, hanging around Waco. And, and uh, you know, by this time, that I think that's the very year that the Cotton Palace got up and going again mm. after it had burned down. So mm-hmm. all of these, you know, the city... Fathers, uh, the Young Men's Business League, Mm -hmm. is like, we need a new hotel because all these other hotels are starting to get kind of old. So they put up a $50,000 prize money uh, to whoever will build a new hotel. Well, Riggins had been a hotel guy. He had managed the Pacific Hotel for a while. So he had some experience with hotels, and he had made his fortune in California. And so he comes to the city leaders, and he says, look, I am still bitter over being impeached. And my whole family has to deal with the shame of this. And the only way that I can, uh, you know, regain my good name is if I'm elected mayor again. Mm. And he says, so if you will uh, help me get elected mayor, I will build your new hotel. (laughs) And so that's exactly what happens. They help him get elected mayor. He uh, collects the $50,000 from the Young Men's Business League. He plans this modern, you know, fireproof brick modern hotel. He figures it's going to cost about $350,000 to build. Uh, He builds it. Uh, It ends up costing about twice that much. Oh, wow. (laughs) So he goes completely bankrupt, loses all his life savings, (laughs) You know, serves out. He ended up serving out his time as mayor, uh, but then he ends up leaving town again and ends up um, moving back to California. Mm. So one of his creditors was this place called the Albert Pick Hotels. Albert Pick Hotels. So they uh, they ran hotels, but they also did things like you know, selling people their furniture and silver and all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. And so they were they were one of the creditors, and they um, ended up buying the hotel. Mm-hmm. So they bought the hotel. Well, everything had a big R. It was called the Riggins Hotel, named after him. And everything had a big R printed on it. All the <laughs> linens had R on it. All the china, everything had this big R on it. Uh, so they wanted to keep the R because they didn't want to get rid of all that stuff. But they did not want to be associated with um, Mayor Riggins. Mm-hmm. So they changed the name to the Raleigh Hotel. And so there, it was the Raleigh Hotel. And that hotel, it stayed a hotel into the 80s. I mean, mm. It was built in 1914. It was a hotel into the 80s. Uh, but again, I just want to read this one other little quote from the newspaper. So this was a guy writing in the newspaper actually in 1913. Uh, you know, so Riggins is raising all this money, and everybody's like, yay, Mr. Riggins, he's so awesome. He's going to build our hotel. And But this one crabby journalist in the paper this sees the ill wind blowing <laughs> and this just cracked me up he says all this applause all these pats on the back from those who stand in the wings while riggins is in the spotlight will butter no parsnips for him no nor cool his fingers when the chestnuts are out of the fire oh my goodness <laughs> <laughs> not even really sure what that means but i just thought that was hilarious so sure enough he goes broke has to move away the hotel stays and it was like the hot swinging place Mm. well into the 40s you know the main highway you could see the lights of the raleigh hotel from the main highway Mm -hmm. Uh, so a lot of people traveling stop through there um 
That's where Elizabeth Freeman stayed oh, when she okay. came to research the Jesse, Jesse Washington lynching. Washington lynching. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, that's where Gussie Oscar lived when she was running the Waco Auditorium. Mm-hmm. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt stayed there. Mm. The Probably the most famous person who stayed there was Babe Ruth when the Yankees came to town to mm-hmm. play at Katy Field. Babe yeah. Ruth stayed there. Uh, my little quote from that that I think is so cute is uh, the man who had the barber shop there. Let's see, his name was uh, Julius Marock. He said, the babe had the biggest head I ever shaved. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then another one, Admiral Richard Byrd stayed there. Oh, wow. And a little quote from the guy who had the shoe shine stand there. His name was Booker T. Dunn. He said he began shining shoes in the Raleigh Barbershop in 1931 and worked there till it closed in 1984. He remembered shining the shoes of Admiral Richard Byrd, the famous Arctic explorer. When asked what he thought of shining the shoes of someone so famous, he said, He only gave me 15 cents. I'd rather shine yours. <laughs> Not a big tip for Admiral Byrd. <laughs> <No. laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was great. But the the hotel actually, like I say, it stayed it was a hotel till the eighties, but it became more like a residential hotel. Mm. A lot of low income people stayed there. Uh mm-hmm. when the highway opened up, a lot of the hotels kind of went down downhill because all the traffic moved to the highway and motels started becoming popular. And uh, eventually it was kind of a, (laughs) there's this one guy who said, yeah, there were too many rats there, (laughs) which made me think, well, I wonder how many rats would have been enough. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) would have been fine. Mm -hmm. Uh, But anyway, during the 80s, it was big, you know, are they going to tear it down? Mm -hmm. And then other people were like, no, it's historic. We need to try to, you know, preserve it. And it went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Finally, uh, the downtown Waco Corporation uh, made, uh, uh, I guess, an agreement with David Sibley when he was in the Texas Senate Mm -hmm. to consolidate all the state offices into that building, and that's why it's still there now. Mm -hmm. But you can go there still and pull back the utilitarian (laughs) little entrance rug, and it still says Raleigh (laughs) on the tile. Yeah, that R is still in there. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> uh, so that 8th and Austin, so just so right. folks can think of where that is. Right. So that was the yeah. furthest out hotel that yeah. I looked at. And a yeah. lot of people thought, oh, my gosh, who's going to stay that so far out from downtown? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I guess the Hippodrome was there then. Right. It was already there. Mm-hmm. So there was some activity right. down, down on that end. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, so I, the Natatorium has always kind of fascinated me a little bit. One of Waco's nicknames at one point was Geyser City. Mm-hmm. Uh, as uh, dozens of other uh, cities uh, like to nickname themselves that had some natural springs. But uh, I'd love to hear your story about the Natatorium. Um, and I'll, I'll say on the Waco History app, I don't know that I've mentioned in a while on the podcast, you can go you can see some of the photographs uh, of the Natatorium, uh, some of the postcards from this popular destination. So tell us a little bit about the Natatorium. Yeah, the Natatorium, I mean, I don't... I don't have any salacious stories about it but the, <laughs> but the I, I mean I just think the whole story of how Waco got to be this uh, tourist resort was just kind of interesting and mm-hmm. in fact our Waco, our Waco walk this weekend is uh, at Bell's Hill and uh, Captain Bell was the one who dug the well that found the artesian water that mm-hmm. was the the hot springs mm-hmm. that was that um, that became such a draw for people all over the country, really, to come to Waco to enjoy the healthful waters of the hot springs. Uh, so the Natatorium was one of several spas, I guess you would call them, mm-hmm. <laughs> that people uh, built to kind of take advantage of this craze of people being interested in hydrotherapy. So it was built by a man named Robert Parrott. He uh, was actually an insurance guy. He also built the Provident Building, Mm -hmm. which was another uh, big, important building at the time. Yeah, it was a huge office building. It was was the biggest office building before the Alaco was built. Mm -hmm. And it was 
Yes, where where was it? It was right next to where True Love yeah. bar is now. Mm-hmm. Um kind of catty corner. Yeah, the um the the stonemason that or the stone merchant that did the work there, it's the same stone that's in the Cottonland Castle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can yeah. tell because yeah, when yeah. you look at the pictures of it, it looks mm-hmm. exactly the same. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, the natatorium was a couple blocks down from there. It was right across the street from the Cotton Belt uh, Depot, mm-hmm. so Fourth and Mary. So mm-hmm. the uh, the Cotton Belt Depot was kind of on the downtown side, I guess you would say, of Mary, and, mm-hmm. and the hotel was right across the street from that. And so the idea was that people would come in on a train, hop off, go for go have a bath and then get back on the train and go back to wherever they were going uh so colonel robert parrott built this grand hotel and it had it well the first hotel he built was only a one-story hotel but like almost every hotel back then it burned down (laughs) and him being an insurance guy i'm sure it was very well insured and so he built a much grander hotel that was four stories i think uh, and it had all of these. I'm looking for the description of all the fancy stuff they had. The natatorium was equipped with departments for both ladies and gentlemen to have Turkish and Roman Russian baths, individual baths, tubs, vapor rooms, sweat and resting rooms, furnished rooms, a cafe, offices, and parlors. The pool was one of the largest in the South and featured a slide, rings, a trapeze, and water gushing from the mouth of a bronze lion. So it was pretty fancy. When you look at the pictures, it mm-hmm. was definitely fancy. Uh, but, you know, the water eventually, um, you know, he discovered the water, I think, in 1886. And so it was popular into the 20s. But then in the 20s, we start, started running out because yeah. we were just, like, wasting it. <laughs> I mean, they just had were pumping water out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, I guess people just didn't understand Um that water can run out back then. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but by the 20s, it was all over with. But, I mean, there's just several just great little, like I'm looking at a postcard right now that about the natatorium that says, this is certainly a swell place to go in bathing as Waco has no beach. Tuesdays and Thursday nights are for ladies and escorts, and you can take a girl and go there and have the best time of your life. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, really? <laughs> Uh, but then as it started to kind of peter out in the 20s, some of the ads <laughs> cracked me up, you know. So, like, here's one um, about the swimming pool, the natatorium swimming pool. Pure water, a clean pool, bottom free of slime and dirt, and does not feel slippery under feet. No stirring of dirt to be swallowed by the bather. Hygienic in every respect. <laughs> Yeah, so they, they may they may be protesting too much. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, you know, here's one over here that says uh, 25 cents, 15 cents if you provide your own suit. <laughs> 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 so things are different then. Uh-huh. Uh, but Waco was, I mean, Geyser City was a big deal. I mean, uh, you know, a couple of years ago before the pandemic, they had a – article in the paper about how much how many people had come to Waco for Magnolia for the silos and everything like I'm thinking about like 2018 or something like that and uh it was like half a million people had visited Waco in the month of March well in 1917 half a million people visited Waco (laughs) for the Cotton Palace that's right you know so Mm -hmm. I mean that's remarkable it is remarkable and you know the hotel one of the little clips I have in here about the Pacific Hotel I think is the guy who ran it was saying yeah we had 150 rooms but I mean we were putting people in the halls and in the dining room and you know any Mm. place there was just a little place for somebody to lay down we were renting it out Mm. So it's kind of amazing to think about that. What what became of the natatorium? What was the fate? It uh, burned. I mean, they, it it burned. It in burned. The, uh, um, let's see, burned down January first, nineteen twenty seven. Okay. And that space is still pretty. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty bleak looking it right is. now, but you still see the train tracks. The same mm-hmm. train tracks that went right in front of the natatorium are still there. They go to that uh, cotton belt 
bridge. Yeah, it's you know? that the we're supposedly we're going to have a yeah, walking yeah, solution yeah, for it at some yeah. point. Um, yeah. So you mentioned the Pacific. Where was the Pacific Hotel? The Pacific Hotel was uh, at the corner of it was it was right, ugh, I'm so terrible at directions. But it was it was right across the road from the Provident Building, so okay. it was at the corner of. Da, 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 da. It was at the corner of Fourth and Franklin. Okay, is that right? Yeah. So the McClelland House was at Fourth and Austin. Then the the Roosevelt is right caddy corner from that. And then on the other side of the street was the Pacific that became the Metropole. So you can probably do a better job of describing it than I am. I mean, you, you start to get an idea of all these big buildings. Uh, people forget how densely right. developed yeah. downtown Waco right. was. So at you the time. could walk down 4th Street and you could go past the McClellan House Hotel, the Provident Building, the Pacific Metropole, the big, huge, beautiful post office building. Uh, the Cotton Belt Depot and the Natatorium were all just right within two or three blocks of each other on Fourth Street. Hmm. Mm-hmm. What was the 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 Pacific? What was the the years of that? Do you remember? The Pacific was eighteen eighty two to nineteen thirty six. Okay, and it had two names: the Pacific and then the Metropole. Hmm. So it was big, fancy hotel. It was the first hotel to have an elevator. Oh, my goodness. So, super fancy. And uh, O. Henry, you know, the short mm-hmm. story writer who's mm-hmm. from Austin, said that the Pacific Hotel saw more honeymooners than Niagara Falls. So wow. Super fancy. <laughs> The view's not as good. No. Yeah, yeah. The view's not as good. Yeah, unless you like watching gunfights. I mean, they had all that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But I suspect if you came for that, you'd be disappointed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe not, though. (laughs) The train, they said the train conductors used to say, 20 minutes, have dinner and see a gunfight. (laughs) (laughs) So it was a wild place back then. (laughs) Uh, So... You know, as you think about kind of hotels over time, you, you looked at a period where, you know, t- a lot of change has taken place in the period mm-hmm. you're covering. The, do you think the role of kind of the hotel in the community changed over that period from what it was, say, in the 1870s to 100 years later, as you said? Yeah, I think, um, you know, for example, one of the things, the earliest hotels – one of the things that they always advertised was what they called uh, display rooms or sample rooms. And what those were, uh, were salesmen, you know, traveling salesmen would come through town and they would rent a room in the hotel and also rent a sample room, you know, and spread out their wares for everybody to come buy whatever. I mean, whatever, mm-hmm. you know, sewing machines, fabric, I mean, whatever they were selling. Mm -hmm. And so the hotels were much more a part of just everyday commerce of Mm -hmm. people coming in and out, you know, and by the end of the time, the hotels were still being used for like civic meetings, like all the different clubs would meet there. And like I said, they were a social scene, like the Raleigh hotel had a big dance floor up on the top, you know, uh, um, open air, you know. Oh, on top, of, on the roof? Yeah, rooftop, uh, rooftop, okay. yeah. Oh, wow. And uh, so it was a big social place to go. Mm-hmm. Um, but it wasn't, you know, you didn't go there to buy stuff like you did in the earliest days. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that, that was a change. And then I think what happened pretty immediately after that, like I mentioned, was that highways started, you know, cars started being more the thing. These were all hotels that were in the city where you could walk to them, you know, and they would advertise being close to the train or stagecoaches leave regularly (laughs) or, Mm -hmm. you know, things like that. Um, But, you know, pretty soon after that, the highway goes around the city. And so Mm -hmm. people start staying in motels and uh, that whole kind of lifestyle of, you know, people lived in the hotels. You know, when you look at the old city directories, you know, you'll see people who lived in the hotels. You know, and their their room and board would pay for their room and food. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, 
No, you just don't. I mean, I guess there are some hotels still where people live there, but you don't think of that as being so much. Mm-hmm. Also, nowadays. think of them that as you were talking, you alluded to earlier, there were these exotic places where there were kind of unknown people coming through right. and yeah. doing yeah. interesting kind of different right. things. Yeah. And so, well, it, and all the political, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, William Jennings Bryan came and spoke at the Pacific Hotel, mm-hmm. you know, when he was running for president. Though there were crowds of people crowding around to hear him, mm-hmm. you know, and, uh, the Ku Klux Klan notoriously met at the Raleigh Hotel and made their plans for running somebody for governor of Texas. Mm. You know, so just kind of the political shenanigans. Yeah, if that you could, take if you could sit in that space over time and kind of mm-hmm. watch. Kind of history past you, right. you you would see a lot a of the lot. life. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, anything else you discovered in your in your deep research? <laughs> Are you glad Jill asked you uh, oh, yeah, to do definitely, this? Definitely, definitely. Because like I say, I had never thought about uh, yeah. uh, hotels really, and and there were some really neat ones here in Waco. And like you said at the very beginning, I mean, I have a little ad here that shows nineteen different hotels in Waco. Back in the days of the Cotton Palace, mm-hmm. well, you know, I was asking the city center people probably a year ago or so, and they said, "Well, you know, there's ten new hotels going up downtown and around downtown in Waco right now." Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I don't know. I have kind of mixed feelings about that because mm-hmm. I'm like, "Holy cow, <laughs> <laughs> that many people are really going to come here?" Yeah. But, uh, but it's just kind of fascinating, like you say, to think about you know all these. People coming and mixing together in this interesting little environment, and I was going to ask you how you picked those five. How'd you how'd you pick? Why'd you pick those? Five? Well, I you know when I first started looking into it, I had a much longer list, mm-hmm. <laughs> but eventually I just got to where well I can't talk about all this. I mean, it's only I think the whole little presentation I was making was only supposed to be about thirty minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I can't. Keep looking, and it, and there was a pretty clear demarcation between downtown hotels at that time, and then when the highway came in, yeah. and the motels, because you know Waco had had some things to do with the motel yeah. scene too. You know, we had some of the first motels, Alamo in, Courts, right? Yeah. Alamo Courts mm-hmm. and all that, and you know, we had a motel on Elm Street that was in the Green Book, the and, College View Court yeah. Hotel, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, but there was a pretty clear demarcation between the downtown time and the highway time. Yeah. So that was one way that I cut it. And then it just came down to what could I find the most information about, um, you know, and the most interesting things about. Well, it sounds like you're interested in you to do yeah. the motel talk next. Yeah. Yeah. Ma- yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that one to you. <laughs> there might be a few too many uh, clandestine yeah, meetings going I, that, on that, there. I think that's bringing in a whole other conversation. <laughs> yeah. Well, Ashley, I want to thank you for joining me on the podcast. It's been sure, a long time sure. coming. Yeah, thanks for having and, me. It was uh, fun. I know you're not an avid listener, as you confessed earlier, but <laughs> at least listen to this one. Oh, well, uh, this will probably be the last one I listen to. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot stand hearing myself talk. <laughs> Cross the Brazos and White Cone Thanks for listening to the Waco History Podcast. Like what you heard? Subscribe, rate, and review our show on iTunes so we can reach more listeners. You can find show notes and info on every episode at wacohistorypodcast.com and more info on Waco's past at wacohistory.org. Our theme music, used with permission, is Cross the Brazos at Waco, performed by the late Billy Walker. For more info on Billy's music, go to billywalker.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. This has been a Rogue Media Podcast.